America, the enemy has gone after him. And I feel honored that I've got another comrade in the struggle. I've got another brother that is standing with me through thick and through thin. I've got a man that is not shocking and jiving and is not bending down, is not turning the other cheek to our enemy. I've got a brother that can go on BBC Radio London and tell it as it is and feel no way about it. This guy, he does not bend and he does not bow. He does not scratch where he doesn't itch. He's uncompromising. And he's the same spirit that Dr. Kalim has put in him is the same spirit that he's putting in through the whole of the new Black Panther Party. I was listening to Minister Farrakhan sometime this year, and Minister Farrakhan referred to Attorney Malik Zuna Shabazz as one of our strongest young leaders to be found anywhere in the annals of North America, and that the black leadership should put all their weight and support behind Attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz. When you hear Minister Farrakhan reference to anybody like that, you know that's a very strong reference. Because Minister Farrakhan is known throughout the world. And as a result of that endorsement, Attorney Malik Zulu Shabazz will be known throughout the world and will be following in the footsteps of Dr. Kali Abdul Muhammad. So, as I introduce him to you today, I want you to listen keenly and carefully. I want you to bring back your questions, because there will be a question and answer session afterwards. And I want you to know that this man is your brother, and he's willing to champion the cause of black liberation and champion the cause of black theology with a revolutionary spirit. And don't be upset when I use the word revolution because all it means is complete constructive change. When you revolve around, when you turn around, when you do a 360 degree turn, that is revolution. And all it is is complete constructive change. So as I bring up my brother, I'd like you, the students in the UK, to give this brother a big black hand. to us. 
So we thanks, give God thanks and praise for giving to us Haile Selassie. Thanks and praise for giving to us Marcus Mosiah Garvey, who gave to us the red, the black, and the green, and taught us about African liberation in Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. Is that right? Marcus Garvey taught us Europe for the European, Asia for the Asia, Asians in Africa for the Africans at home and abroad. We thank God for Dr. Osaji for Kwame Nkrumah. Osaji for means redeemer. And Kwame Nkrumah, the honorable Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, gave us an ideology of Pan-Africanism, meaning the struggle for the liberation and the unification of African people all over the planet. We thank the one God for, I come here from the United States, I mean, sorry about that, I mean the United States of America. And we thank God again for those that our chairman, Brother Huey, has mentioned, Harriet Tubman and uh, Nat Turner, Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Malcolm X, and others. We here tonight, the new Black Panther Party, coming in the footsteps of a bold black man who picked up the gun in America. And he picked up the gun and said, arm yourself or harm yourself. Power to the people and death to the fascist pig. We come in the name of Huey P. Newton and some other bold black women and men that stood up in the members as members of the original Black Panther Party. We also come in the name of one that has gone on, a great Pan-Africanist. He was known in the 60s as Stokely Carmichael, but he went all over the world organizing our people, Brother Kwame Ture. And again, I, like my brother, come in the name of a bold, bald-headed black man. Uh, he was named Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad, and he proclaimed to us, he did, that he came to give the white man hell from the cradle to the grave. And I bear witness he did just that, and I am just his stoop. And I greet you again, black power. Black power. To the Muslims, assalamu alaikum. Hotel. Hotel. Shalom. Free the land. Black laws for all black people. Please give yourself a black hand. To the student organizers who have invited us here at the university, please uh, give them a hand. We won't be long, but we must be strong. It is a pleasure to see all of you and to look in your faces. I am at the end point of my tour here in the United Kingdom. I've been on a Stop the Killing tour. I've been blessed to speak in Birmingham on Saturday at the Great Spiritual Debate. I was blessed to speak in London in the community on the subject of Stop the Killing. Great crowds everywhere. We were able to go into Nottingham. I didn't even know there were black or African people in Nottingham. But there's a whole lot of us in Nottingham. And we had a town hall meeting last night in Nottingham where we have been raising up uh, recruits in the black liberation movement. But here on this final leg of this tour here, I'm most happy to be at the university tonight. And the reason for that is I have sat in the same seats that you sit in now. I, coming from the campus of Howard University as a Howard University undergraduate student and as a Howard University law student, have sat in the same seats that you sit in now. And I understand the value of the college student. I understand the potential of the college student. I am here to say tonight that you are the future 
of black or African people all over the planet that our future is depending on you. And you tonight must hear what I say very carefully. You here tonight must uh, weigh what I say in a critical fashion. I will challenge your minds tonight. I will challenge what your professors have been teaching you. I will challenge what is in the lie prayers. I said the lie prayers of this university. I will challenge what you have previously believed. I will attack the previous arguments of some of your professors. And then I will open up the question and answer session so you will have a chance to question what I'm saying. But I come here out of the spirit of love. I, as a barrister or attorney at law, a practicing attorney at law, one who can get down and throw down in the courtroom in America, but I'm also a revolutionary. I'm not just a lawyer, I'm a revolutionary lawyer. I'm here to tell you tonight, if you're planning on becoming a doctor, you can't just be a doctor. I'm Dr. Bob Smith. It's your black self. It's your African self talking about I'm Dr. Bob Smith. You can't just be a doctor. You must be a revolutionary doctor. I'm here to tell you tonight if you're going to become a barrister or a lawyer, you just can't be attorney Steve Washington. You know how some of you guys get in the UK? <laughs> trying to act like the British white folks? You can't just be some of you, and you know who I'm talking about. Some of you running around on this campus is blue, black, as black as you can be. Some of you as black, so black it looks like if you spit, you'll spit black ink. <laughs> huh? Some of you as black as my leader taught me as 150 million midnights running around on this campus talking like white people and trying to act like the British. If you're going to be an attorney or a barrister, you must be a revolutionary attorney or a revolutionary barrister, one that is dedicated to overturning the world of your colonial slave master. Huh? going to be an engineer or in communications or media or whatever field you might go into, you must be revolutionary in that field. A revolution means complete constructive change. You cannot come out of here just hoping to beg and plead to the British man for a job. You must come out here with an idea to make a job for your black self. Huh? What good is it for us to get an education? What is it for us to get the higher degrees of learning so we can go out here and get a job to help build up the white man's world? The white man's world is already built up enough. I look around here in London. London is money everywhere. There's plenty of money in London. Banks, financial institutions. And when you look around London and you see the wealth of London, the capital of London, capital meaning the finance, rooted in London, you must understand the origin of that capital and that finance. These British colonialists did not make this city, the wealth of this city, on their own. They did not get it from some kind of hard work or an ethical or moral labor. But these British colonial criminal colony crackers got this wealth from the theft of the black man and the brown man and the yellow man's wealth all over the planet Earth. That's and right. you cannot build that up any further. You have to work to tear it down. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. You cannot come out of here with fear of the colonialist or the European. Your knowledge is to make you dangerous. Huh? 
Your knowledge is not to make you a better servant to your British master or your French master. Your knowledge is to make you dangerous so you may turn them out of power. Huh? The sun must have set on the British Empire, but it must completely set on the British Empire. And you must have your mind, you must have your focus on the freedom and liberation of your people. You cannot forget about Africa. You cannot forget about the Caribbean and your brothers and sisters in Jamaica and Trinidad and the struggle that you have to free them. Our people, African people, black people, we're like lions trapped in a cage. We're like lions trapped in a cage. You've been to a circus. How many of you are in a circus? Put your black hand up. How many of you have been to a circus? Let me see your black hand. Huh? You've seen the lion in the circus. You've seen the elephant in the circus. That's not a real lion. That's not a real elephant. You have a little wimpy, uh, wimpy white trainer with his little whip, big mighty lion, and the little wimpy trainer is taking the lion and whoosh, and the lion is jumping up. Lion is running away from this little skinny white trainer in the circus. Huh, black man? Tell him the lion jump up. Tell him the lion lay down. Tell him the lion to roll around and do flips. While the little trainer whoosh, whips the feet of the lion. That ain't no real lion. I damn it, if that was a real lion, he'd take that claw and snatch that whip out of the trainer's hand. He'd take one swipe and snatch the little crackers, I mean the trainer's head, and bust out of that cage and be on his way back to Africa. You are a lion, but you have been, you are a lion, but you are lying in captivity, black man. The Bible says that there's a lion that's asleep in Judah. You are asleep. Look at the elephant in the circus. Big, mighty African elephant. Strong African elephant with a little weak, wimpy white trainer. Big elephant jumping up, thousand pound elephant. 100 pound trainer, jumping up, making the elephant jump up, making the elephant do flips, making the elephant speak French, making the elephant speak English, make, I mean, making the elephant, huh? God damn it, I mean, damn it. If that was a real elephant, he would smash that little trainer, stomp and step on that little trainer, bust out of that cage, smash the crackers in the damn stands and be on his way back to Africa. Black power. Black power. You are that elephant. You are that lion. You are that one who has been stripped of power and now are in captivity. And you have been mastered through the process of fear. And the first thing that you, our future generation of, must get rid of is the fear of your colonial master. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. I didn't come here tonight to play games with you. I didn't come here tonight with the sands, with a dance and a song. I didn't come, as my leader told me, to lighten up. I came to tighten up. I didn't come to beat around the bush. I didn't come to pin the tail on the donkey. I came to pin the tail on the honky. Right here at this university, I came to place the blame squarely where it belongs. Black power. Black power. I know you're not used to hearing our people speak like this, huh? But I'm a student of a bold black man who is a student of another bold black man. I've been taught by Dr. Khaled Abdul Muhammad. I've been taught and inspired by Minister Louis Farrakhan. I've been inspired by Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, and the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Kwame Nkrumah, Stephen Biko, and others. I didn't come here to play. You here on this campus, I am taught that what kind of student you are will determine what kind of person you will be later on in life. That if you are an apathetic student, that if you are a disinterested student, 
that later on in life when you graduate, you will be apathetic and disinterested. That's right. If you are a revolutionary or a progressive or a conscious or an active student, then you will be a revolutionary, conscious, progressive, and activist black man and black woman mm -hmm. in life. Is that right? What yes, kind sir. of student you are now sets the standard for what you will be later. Huh? If you are on this campus and you don't have the mind right now, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a strategy right now, how you will fulfill some kind of role to liberate African people, we can count you out for the rest of your life. And you will spend your whole life trying to get some corporate job, trying to get a job in Lloyd's of London or some bank, believing that if you be a good nigga, <laughs> if you can just be a good nigga and separate yourself from the other niggas, then somehow you will be able to rise to the top of the corporate floor. And I damn it, five years from now, when you get your little job and you see that racism is so thick here that you that it that it can can be cut and cannot be cut with a knife, and you get there and find out that there's a glass ceiling, that there are two rules in the corporate world, that there are the white corporate rules and rules for you. That there's white employment advancement rules, and then there's another rule for you, meaning that there's only so far you can go. And when the stress, the pressure, and the racism get to you, by the time you get up on one of them high floors, you'll be ah, jumping out of the damn building. Because the psychological pressure, the psychological stress, the psychological impact of this racist world will be on you. So you should know now what you're headed for. And you should make a way for yourself. Are you thinking about if you're going to become lawyers? How many want to become barristers or lawyers? Put your hand up. How many want to serve in the medical profession or become doctors? Put your hands up. How many want to go in the field of science? Hmm? Communications. Huh? Uh, building, property, and other types of building. How many don't know what the hell they want to do? <laughs> Changing your major every year, so uh, your, your focus every six months. It's all right. But this is the time now. We got more hope in you right now than anyone because you haven't sold out yet. You haven't had the opportunity to, sold out, to sell out yet. Now let's get a few things straight about uh, on this college campus. Many of our brothers and sisters, many of our brothers, black men, you don't want the black one. That's right. Yeah. Come on, go ahead, go ahead. Men, yeah. uh, let's be straight. You don't want an African woman. You don't want a black woman. You don't want this woman from Tanzania or from Cameroon or from Jamaica or from Trinidad. You want a British woman. You want a French woman. You with your black self are happy as you can be when you've got this blonde head blue eye. Straight up, straight down, straight up. <laughs> out of your mind walking around this campus in front of the queen of the planet Earth. Walking around this planet with your African woman in need of you. Walking around this planet with these beautiful, gorgeous goddesses around you. But you want this Caucasus. You want this British woman. Black man, you should be shot. Right. Come on. What the hell do you look like? I'm seeing, walking around, seeing you seem like you as happy as you can be. With Elizabeth. And Suzanne. Huh? The daughters of your colonial master. Huh? The daughters of those who have robbed your people. Are you here teaching racial hatred, Mr. Shabazz? Hell no. I say like my leader, the white woman is all right for the white man. 
but not for you, black man. Your duty is to the black woman, that African woman who is suffering and in need of you. Mm -hmm. For there are not enough um, available, able-bodied men now here that are able to serve the black woman. And our women should not be seeing you running around on this campus with these white women like you out of your mind. That's what, huh? Some of you in this audience loves tickling your toes with Susie at night. <laughs> Under the covers. Some of you, because the white man has beat you down so much, you think you're getting a victory over the white man when you got the legs of Elizabeth around you at night. That pale white skin on your black behind. Huh? Some of you dream of that, like that's a victory. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. I, I love the black woman. I don't want nothing else but me a black woman. The black woman again, the queen of the planet Earth, the daughters of Queen Hatshepsut. Sure. Huh? The daughters of Queen Tari, the daughters of Queen Nzinga, the daughters of Queen Yah Esantewa. I don't want nothing else but a black woman. I don't want a woman that has to get some kind of injection to make her behind look all right. I don't want some woman that has to get an injection to make her lips look all right. I want a woman. Uh, I don't. I want a woman who has nappy hair, huh? <laughs> who don't have to get a whole bunch of. I'm not knocking you if you do. It's all right. But I don't have to have a woman that has to get her hair take a whole bunch of chemicals and pour it in her hair. I can take a woman, huh? It's all right if you do. I'm still your brother. I love you. It's all right. It's all right if you. It's all right. But we're saying there should be no need today to have a hot comb burning off the side of your head, trying to be in the image of your colonial master. The number one thing that they have done is to colonize our minds. Your mind is under colonial occupation. I love you, don't get mad, but you're still wearing the white man's name. We here in the year 2004, as black as we are, as African as we are, we're still running around here saying, as black as we are, my name is Bob Smith. <laughs> hmm? My name is Stephen Jones, Brother Martin, huh? Wearing the white man's name. You're not Elizabeth. I know your mama gave you that name. This is a colonial name. Do you see a white, do you see British people, white people running around here? If a white boy walked in here today and said, hey, my name is Lumumba Kenyatta. <laughs> You would just bust out and fall out of the floor. That would seem outrageous to you. Huh? If a white woman came in here, huh? And said, my name is Yaasantiwa. You wouldn't believe that. You would think that's a joke. But to them, you look like a joke. Truth. Wearing their names. Truth. Meaning that there's meaning giving them the sign that I'm still your master. I don't give them the gratification or the satisfaction of believing that they are still my master. Sister, when you get a divorce or one of your parents have gotten a divorce from a husband, the first thing they do is what? Drop that man's name and say, I don't want nothing to do with that man's name. You must take on your own African name, your own African cultural identity. I don't care what you think about Africa. I don't care what they say about Africa. I don't care what the hell's going on in Africa. I say Africa is great. Truth. I say Africa is beautiful. Truth. I say Africa is the origin of all civilization and that we must latch on and embrace our African culture that you cannot run from Africa unless you run from yourself. Huh? Black power. Black power. Black power. Just give me a few minutes and we'll open up. I know some of you in the audience look like you disturbed by what I'm saying. I come here to disturb your mind. I come here to bust you upside your head with the truth because I love you. And I know that we've been lied to too long. I'm not one of these handkerchief head leaders. One of these. You've seen some of these shoe shining tap dancing leaders. 
come here with a bowl of porridge, lying to you? I'm a revolutionary. You must be revolutionary. Black power? Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Look, in Africa, Nigeria, blue, black, black man, judge, on the bench, judge in the uh, courtrooms of Nigeria, other parts of Africa, jet black, blue black, purple black, black man, sitting up there with a white wig on his black head. <laughs> with a white wig, looking like he's Duke so-and-so. Huh? That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. We must throw off the colonial mind, throw off the colonial name, throw off the colonial mentality, and get back to black. What is black? You, some of you say, I'm not black. I don't want to be black. Because I looked in the Oxford Dictionary. <laughs> huh? I told you about these libraries and the dictionary. <laughs> You've been getting the shaft in these books. Black, according to the white man's books, means negative. Huh? If he wants to set you up or put a negative spin on you, he says he's going to blackball you. If he says he's going to bribe you, he says he's going to blackmail you. If it's a stock market crash, he calls it Black Tuesday. Everything negative he puts in front of it is Black. But black power means to define, defend, and develop. You should have your notepads out today. Professors here, not these professors that are hired by the white man. It's professors from Almighty God and their ancestors. Black means color, culture, and consciousness. Black means color, culture, and consciousness, and a connection to the Creator. Black also means original and universal. Huh? Color, culture, consciousness, a connection to the Creator. That's how we define black. That was given to us by Dr. Maulana Karim, one of our great African scholars and the founder of Kwanzaa. Black also means universal and original. Let's start with universal. Black means universal. All over the 196,940,000 square miles of the planet Earth, the original man and woman anywhere on the planet Earth is the black man and the black woman. Anywhere on the 57,255,000 square miles of land, coming up out of 139,685,000 square miles of water, on a planet that weighs six sextillion tons and is spinning at 1,037 and one third miles an hour at the heat of the sun, which is 14,072 degrees, and sends a light traveling at 1,086 miles per second, causing that planet again to spin at 1,037 and one-third miles an hour on that planet Earth. You are the original man and the original woman everywhere on the planet. You, huh? You are the original man and the original woman. God ain't no pop-up toaster God. Pop up some Chinese people here, and pop up some white people here, and pop up some brown people here, and pop up some African people here. Hell no. All DNA, all human life goes back to the black woman. Every human being on the planet, no matter where they are, whether they be in Siberia or Alaska or Asia or some part of Vietnam, all of their genetics go back to you, black woman. You are not some itch with the bee in front of you. You're not some whore. You're not some woman to cast aside. You, black woman, are the origin of all life. You, black man, are not some thug, some gangster, some low-down man, some nigga. You are the father of civilization. You are the father of all mankind. There would be no uh, brown man 
if there were no brown man and woman, if there were no black man and black woman. There will be no red man and red woman if there were no black man and black woman. There would be no yellow man and yellow woman if there were no black man and black woman. And there will certainly be no white man and white woman if there were no black man and black woman. You are the origin of all life. All life comes out of Africa. LSB Leakey and the boys went back long ago and found the origin of life three million years old. And it was in Africa. And they called that woman Lucy, LSB Leakey, the scholars. But every few years or so, they go back and find another black man or another black woman that's even older than that. Why is that? I'm here to, I'm here to tell you today, you cannot find our origin in the desert. You cannot find our origin in the rocks. You cannot find our origin in the trees. Our origin is beyond that. Our origin is in God Almighty. Before there was a planet, there was the black man and the black woman. You say, how's that? In the very mind, in the very original mind of the creator himself was the mind of a man or a woman that will eventually come down the line and stand on the planet. But you existed in your mental form before you manifest in your physical form. You are the idea of the creator himself when he decided that he would produce a man and a woman. For the very Bible says that God made man in his own image and his own likeness. Huh? Well, if God makes man in his own image and his own likeness and the first man is a black man and a black woman, I ask you the thought-provoking question, what color is God? Huh? You want to come down here and fight me now when I suggest to you, huh, about a black God. You got a white God now. You got some blonde-haired, blue-eyed Caucasian on your wall calling that white boy Jesus. That can be your God now, but when I suggest to you a black God, you want to fight with me. Hmm? Mm. Black power. Black power. I say to you like Marcus Mosiah Garvey, I say to you from the scripture that Jesus or Yeshua is a black man. Huh? Jesus is not some blonde-haired, blue-eyed hippie. Jesus or Yeshua is a black man. The Bible says he has hair like lamb's wool and feet like fine brass burned in an oven. Look at that lamb's wool you got. You got your hat on now, black man. Take your hat off for a second. Look at that. That's lamb's wool. Huh? And them pretty black feet you got is like fine brass burned in an oven. Jesus or Yahshua, huh? Comes from Africa. You say, no, he comes from Palestine. I say Palestine is in Africa. Some white folks in England went down there and cut a ditch called the Suez Canal. Huh? But you look at the map, it's looking you right in your face. That's Northeast Africa. Hair like lamb's wool, feet like fine brass, burned in an oven. Say he's of the seed of David and the root of Solomon. And Solomon say, look not upon me just because I'm black. Huh? Your Lord and Savior, for those of you who are of the Christian faith, and even if you ain't, Yahshua or Jesus is an African. You've been given an image of Michelangelo's cousin that Michelangelo painted as a Caucasian and all of these hypocrites in England went and took it through colonialism all over the world with a picture of a white man as Jesus saying, really saying that the divine is white and to challenge white is to challenge divine. Everywhere they went, they went with what? A Bible and a gun and a picture of a white Jesus. A Bible and a gun and a picture of a white Jesus. You go to Ghana today. Blue, black, jet, black, purple, black, 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 Ghana. And big billboards with a white Jesus in Ghana. Huh? With a real revolution, we'll go up and snatch and bust them billboards down in Ghana. Black power. Black power. If you have a white Jesus on your wall, you cannot accept falsehood. You must go to your wall, take that white Jesus down, and throw it in the trash can. Huh?
revolution is starts first in the mind. I'm working on your mind right now. I'm working on your thought conceptions and preconceptions right now. Then I will open up and allow you to question what I'm saying. Look. I want you to understand, I don't want to leave the point of us being the original people without touching for you scientists and medical people on the subjects of biology. How many of you have heard of Dr. Francis Crush Wilson? Many of you have. Just for the record, how many of you have heard of Dr. Yusef Ben Yakin? True. Dr. John Henry Clark? True. Dr. Ivan Van Serta? True. Mm -hmm. So many of you can dig what I'm saying. Mm, and some of you have maybe forgotten what I'm saying. I'm here to remind you. You, being the original people of the planet, are dangerous. And if you want to understand apartheid, if you want to understand racism, you cannot understand it in the absence of a discussion on biology and genetics. Mendel, the German scientist, teaches that dark genes are dominant and light genes are recessive. That dark genes, black genes, are dominant and light genes are recessive. And Dr. Francis Crest Wilson teaches us that the, our struggle with the European or the Caucasian or the white man is based on the white man, the Caucasian, or the European's fear of genetic annihilation. Huh? That if we are allowed to intermix and intertwine and intermarry with white people, that there will be no more white race. The European birth rate is on the decline. And if you are allowed to integrate and intermarry with white people anywhere on the planet that it will produce the decline and the destruction of the white race. They are constantly in fear of you, black man. They are in fear of what's between your legs. Huh? The number one fear, subconscious fear of white people is what's between your legs. You've seen in America the shocking pictures of black people being hung from trees, hung and lynched. But one of the things that they frequently do when they hang us and lynch us is they cut off the male organ of the penis of the man. Consistently, they will cut off the male organ or the penis of the man uh, as a sign of their fear. Sometimes they take it and they take the male organ and they will shove it in the mouth of the victim that they have killed. Other times they take the organ of the black male and they place it in a jar with an inscription on it warning about this is what happens, or this is what would have happened, or this is what happened then if you challenge the white man. They are in fear of your genitalia. They are in fear of your power. Now the white woman loves it. Black power. And don't you, any of you, think you being revolutionary because of what I'm saying. You think you're going to drive out the white race by going out there with Susie and Becky. <laughs> Thinking you're being revolutionary. Some of you have that look in your eye right now. That lust. It's like a disease, a lust for the white woman. Huh? I saw a brother in Northampton. Was that it? It's uh, coming back from Birmingham. And he was with his white buddy, and it looked like he was just salivating over the white women. He had him a few drinks, and he was out there with his white buddy and all these white women, and it looked like he had lost his mind. He was, <laughs> he had lost his mind. You can't use that as that is cute. The white man has a fear of genetic annihilation, so he sets up apartheid. He sets up division between the races to keep you away from his woman, though it's obviously losing control today. Black power. Black power. You are powerful. What I'm saying, you are powerful. Everybody ain't equal. I'm not one here to tell you that we're all equal and we're all the same. That's garbage. I'm here to tell you, not only are you not inferior, but you are in fact supreme. That's right. Huh? They accuse me of teaching black supremacy. Mm -hmm. I say you are supreme. Biologically and genetically, you are supreme. Well, how so? 
if two white men and two white women get together, they can do it all day and do it all night. They can only produce a white baby. Huh? They can do it all day, do it all night. They can have orgies. All they can produce is a white baby. If the brown man and the, uh, pardon me, the yellow man and the yellow woman get together, they can do it all day, they can do it all night, they can only produce a yellow baby or a white baby. If the brown man and the brown woman get together, do it all day, do it all night, they can only produce a brown, a yellow, and a white baby. But you, black man and black woman, if you get together, you can produce black, you can produce brown, you can produce yellow, you can produce white, you can even produce something that's whiter than white, an albino. How many of you have seen an albino? A black man, white with all white features, 180 degrees opposite. All life comes from the black man and the black woman. You are a supreme individual, you are supreme. And I'm telling you, this is why. You have been attacked and are being attacked today. The white man has only been here a little over 6,000 years. You've been here millions of years, but the Caucasian has only been here 6,000 years. How many of you are into the Bible? How many of you are familiar with the word in the Bible? Huh? The Bible is a 6,000 year old book, and I'm here to tell you that the white man, the Caucasian, ain't been here no more than 6,000 years. Now you've been lied to in your theology class. How many of you are, in, are theology students? Hmm? Or will be? You've been lied to in your theology. You've been told that Adam and Eve are the first two humans. Huh? Adam and Eve are the first humans. Jesus was 2,000 years ago, Moses was 4,000 years ago, Adam was 6,000 years ago, Adam was the first man, and Eve was pulled out of the rib of Adam. Now that's a lie of my I've heard. That's a lie. How could man and woman be 6,000 years old when I just told you that white anthropologists and scientists have placed the origin of man at millions of years old? In the, in the book of Genesis, it says that God, uh, uh, that it was Adam and Eve, right? And that Adam and Eve had who? Who? Talk black to me. Cain and Abel. Adam and Eve produced Cain and Abel. So it's supposed to be four people on the earth, right? And what happened with Cain and Abel? One kill the other. Cain killed Abel, right? Mm. So if Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, and Cain killed Abel, then there's supposed to be three people on the planet, according to, the, according to what we have been taught, right? Well, if Cain killed Abel, then it says Cain went into the land of Nod and took a wife. Huh? Now, how in the hell is this Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel, Cain killed Abel? How Cain gonna go into the land of Nod and take a wife? You've been lied to, tricked, and bamboozled. Uh, Cain went into the land of Nod that took a wife because there were people on the earth before Adam. Have you heard of the pre-Adamites? Have you studied the pre-Adamites? It says, let us make man. Let us. Who is the us? Huh? He starts out speaking in the singular form uh, that I will uh, create everything. The God talking in the Bible. But when he gets to man, he said, let us. Who is the us making a man? The land of Nod, where Cain went to take a wife from, Nod means asleep. You may not have heroin over here, do you? You ever seen somebody nod no heroin? Huh? Hmm? You seen somebody nod no heroin? Nod means asleep. And that's where you've been. The white man is the Adamite. The Caucasian is the Adamite. You are no cursed seed of Ham. Ham looked at Noah in the tent. I mean, this is baby knowledge. Ham looked at Noah in the tent, and Ham was cursed. The Hamitic hypothesis, the justification for the enslavement of the African by the so-called Jewish rabbis and the Christian scholars who say that we are the cursed seed of Ham. I'm here to tell you that you were before Ham and before Noah. And Ham could not be cursed and turned black. You were before Ham. You were before Noah. You were before Adam. Hmm? You were before Adam. 
Adamy, but 6,000 years old, and the white man is only 6,000 years old. You built the city of Thebes, T-H-E-B-E-S, on within 10,000 B.C. You were building pyramids before Adam. King Khafre, King Khufu, building pyramids in the Giza Plateau. Egypt, the real, the black name of Egypt is what? Kemet. Kemet. Uh, look like we got some, some, somebody know something here, huh? The name, the black name, the real name of Egypt is? Huh? Kemet. Talk black to me. Hey, I am black, man. I see you're pretty taxing. Okay? No, no, I'm talking to you. You got it. I'm talking to them. Kemet. Let me hear you say Kemet. 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 Kemet means black. Huh? And it was in 6,000, I'm talking about, my whole subject is the power of black history. Huh? But Kemet, or Egypt, was founded by a black man from Ethiopia named Menes Ajeptos. You read Chancellor Williams, The Destruction of Black Civilization. He teaches us that, that 6,000 years ago, uh, around 4,000 BC, when first the entire continent of Africa was called Ethiopia. And Ethiopia means land of the black and the burnt skinned people. But Manis Ajepto sailed down or up the Nile and founded what's called Kemet. And they started the first dynasty of the Kemetic Empire. And in that glorious black dynasty in Kemet, we built pyramids that still today are the wonders <coughs> of the world. You see these little castles they got up here? These castles are falling apart. They built a castle in 1300 or 1400. The Cracker's castle is falling apart. But the pyramids still today stand as a wonder of the world. The pyramids today still uh, are called by the white man one of the great wonders of the world, built by African people, built by black people, with the Sphinx sitting right in front of the pyramids in the center of the planet. The Sphinx, a uh, head of a black man on the body of a lion. I talked to you about that lion. The head of a black man on the body of a lion with the nose blown off. <laughs> How did the nose get blown off and why did the nose get blown off the Sphinx? It's because this other old devil named Napoleon, huh? This other white man from France went and when they went to Egypt, and came in and discovered that it was a black civilization that Napoleon became furious. Napoleon and his army became arrogant, so they took their cannons and lined up their cannons and blew the nose off the Sphinx to take the broad nose and the black nose off of the Sphinx. And you see many times in ancient artifacts, they try to blow the nose, huh? that broad, that nose you hate, that big African nose. Huh? to blow the nose off the Sphinx. Uh, and today, from Napoleon and his army taking the cannon to blow the nose off the Sphinx, you get what's called the 21-gun salute. Hmm? But they do this to deny you your history. There's a conspiracy to deny you the greatness of your history because they know that the people who don't know where they came from will never know where they can go. There's power in history. Power means the ability to change things. And if you can be and if you can be tricked and fooled to believe that you're just a nigga and that somebody found you with a bone in your nose, running around naked in Africa, huh? That you ain't never done nothing but run around naked and the white man had to civilize you. Hell, we were building palaces while the white man was crawling on his all fours in the caves and hills of you. Huh? You were the masters of civilization when the Caucasian was crawling on his all fours in, his, in the caves and hills of Europe, eating his meat raw. Eating raw meat. Huh? Eating the raw meat and eating each other. Huh? You go into these restaurants, I'll have a rare steak. Please give me my steak rare. Give me my steak rare. With the blood running all out the steak. Huh? Rare means raw. As soon as the steak come, like my leader taught me, as soon as the steak come, you look at all that blood running out of that steak, you say, I ain't order this. 
trying to act like the white man you heard next to you ordering a big rare or raw steak. The white man came up eating raw meat because he didn't know the science of cooking food. The white man came up in the caves and hills of Europe not knowing mortuary science, huh? When you, uh, when you authored what's called mortuary science, huh? the science of architecture, the science of law, the science of language, writing, and religion all come from Africa, all come from Kemet, or Egypt, or Kush, or Nubia, or Ethiopia. That's where it all began. Black power? Black power. Black power. I'll, be, I'll be through in a few minutes. But I, want, I know I've shook some of you up. But I come to tell you the power of black history. I come to tell you the power and the greatness of African civilization and to raise your hopes for the future. Eating each other. Huh? Cannibalism. Hmm? AIDS in Africa. AIDS in Africa. We'll talk about this in the question and answer session. Ain't no history of, ain't no heroin, uh, ain't no why uh, history of intravenous drug use in Africa. Huh? Needles going around in Africa. There are two ways that AIDS are spread by needles and really by homosexual activity. I know they man sizzle. Huh? I know they man sizzle. But I'm going to sizzle up here as well. Damn, oh, yeah. <laughs> can't duck these issues. Yeah. But in the African society, there is no uh, history of this tradition That's of right. a black man getting in the bed with another black man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, how crazy you look. Big black man in the bed with another black man smooching and kissing on another black man. <laughs> Are you homophobic, Dr. Shabazz? No, I'm not homophobic. I just don't believe that the black man should be putting his penis in the behind of another black man. lips on another lips of another black man or in the bed doing it to another black man. That is that is white man's culture. That's he right. wants to allow that. That is I ain't left you out, black woman. I'll cut you a break for a second. Since you want to now use the excuse that there, you know, there are no men. <laughs> no man, so Jane is my girlfriend. <laughs> Jane is my girlfriend, so you're no man, and y'all in the club dancing and kissing and all of this. Okay, we'll leave that to the side right now and give us a short time to say, get him. Get him. We love you, black woman, and we ask you to give us the opportunity to help get the black man back together. So then we will remove, remove that excuse. Hmm? Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. We love you regardless to your sexual orientation. We love you. We love you. There's no doubt about it. Every black man and every black woman, regardless to sexual orientation, we love you, but we must have a revolution. We must have a change, and if we must have a change, that means we have to destroy much of what we are in order to build something new. Black power? Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. Black power. I'm getting ready to wrap and I'll take your questions. Look. Look at the bold black man on the continent of Zimbabwe. Look at the bold black man, Robert Mugabe. Look at this black man who is now, he may be hated by the British. He may be hated by old Tony Black, God damn it, but he's your brother and mine, our king and our revolutionary warrior, Dr. Robin Mugabe. Huh? I'm not a capitalist, I'm not a communist, I'm a nationalist, a pan-Africanist, but I'm also a Mugabeist. Huh? I'm a Mugabeist, and I believe in Mugabeism. I believe that Cecil Rhodes was a murderer. That's right. I know that Cecil Rhodes was a robber. Don't go around here thinking you've achieved something if you become a Rhodes scholar. 
Cecil Rhodes was a murderer. Cecil Rhodes was a criminal. Cecil Rhodes and the boys have the blood of the black people on their hands, and Robert Mugabe has taken a stand to take the land from the no good British colonial slave master and colonial master and give it back to the people. Give it back to the people. If we had more leaders like Robert Mugabe on the continent of Africa, Africa would be free. Huh? If the philosophy of Dr. Robert Mugabe would spread throughout Africa, we would be able to take the land and the resources back from the colonial slave master, take it back from these Swiss banks, take it back from these European banks, and put the money and the resources back into Africa. Crazy as hell. We got to buy food. We sitting here in the most richest, beautiful country, uh, agriculturally, a uh, potentially prosperous nation on the earth, and we gotta buy our food from Europe. We gotta buy some gas or some oil from Europe, and it's right here under your feet. Huh? Some of you are into mining. Some of you will be into engineering. Some of you it will be into agricultural science. We cannot continue the brain drain from Africa where all of our greatest minds our greatest skill, take all of our skill and go out here and give it to the white man. We must put our brains and our mind and our focus back to Africa if we ever going to get free. Huh? We cannot continue the brain drain, continue the brain strain. Dr. Robert Mugabe is setting an example. Now in South Africa or Azania, they have the philosophy. They say, we want our land back too. The sham independence in South Africa wasn't real, real independence. That's right. Nelson Mandela freed South Africa. Please. I don't give, look, Nelson Mandela ain't my man. I respect Nelson Mandela, but he ain't my man. Damn it, I'd rather have Winnie Mandela. That's right. That's right. You give me Winnie Mandela, huh? And we can cry out a mandala, huh? Ingwetu. Huh? Winnie Mandela is the one. Winnie Mandela is the freedom fighter. Winnie Mandela deals with these times. Winnie Mandela is for true freedom. Nelson Mandela just let the white man run away with the whole store. Black power. Black power. Then I don't like the way he dissed his black wife. His, his, huh? You have the power. Huh? Today, you must remember everything that I have said. And even though some of it may be painful, some of it may bust up your personal relations, some of it may bust up certain thoughts and ideologies that you have in your mind, you must embrace everything that I have said today because you are the generation of change. There is no accident while you are in this room tonight. There is no accident. There's something in your family background. There's something in your genetic makeup that caused you to be here today. You are not here by accident. You, like me, I don't have a pessimistic attitude about the liberation of our people. I don't have a cynical attitude. I'm not without hope. I'm not walking around in despair because of the condition of our people because I know that, that, that the Almighty God has given me a mission and I'm working my mission, working my job all over the planet. You said, but I have to make a living. Damn it, I'm making a living. I practice law, have plenty of clients. I roll a nice vehicle. Huh? I live in a nice home. Hmm? But that does not stop me from taking a stand for my people. You can't be all materialistic and not be realistic. Right. All materialistic and not realistic. You just want a job? You just want some money? Huh? You stand up for your people, you'll have everything that you need. Huh? In the universal womb, the womb is like a giant universe. And in the universal womb, there is always one that is coming to birth to answer the cries of our people. Our mothers and foremothers, our fathers have labored much. You think you're here at this university campus because of yourself, huh? You think you're so smart, huh? Because you got good grades and good schools and you think you're all that, huh? 
You're not here because of that. You may be here in part because you have some smarts, some genius in you. But damn it, you're here because your parents couldn't be here. You are here because some of your parents were denied these universities. You're here because some of your parents had to clean the diapers of white folks or British folks or European folks to struggle to put some pennies together for you to be here. Somebody struggled. Somebody died. Somebody had to take insults, abuse, discrimination to pave the way for you to be here. And you cannot turn your back on those who allow you to be here today. You cannot get bourgeois. You cannot believe that you are above your people. If you become a lawyer and your people are in this condition, the white man just going to look at you as a nigga lawyer. <laughs> huh? If you become somebody great, you will only become a token. And you don't want to become a token. A token is something you put in a subway, right? It's just a token, huh? A token is a symbol. A token is a sign. You don't want the token, you want the real substance of complete and total liberation. You want to make something meaningful out of your life. Black power. Black power. Thank you for listening. Black power. Black power. come here to wage mental warfare. For the Bible says that the battle is for the minds and hearts of our people. I'll take any question you have, even if you want to challenge me. If you want to challenge me tonight, it's all right. You come on, any question you have. And if you don't believe you can challenge me, go get Professor Rothschild. Or go get Professor, Professor Rothstein and bring his wife behind him here. And sit him on the front row and see if he can challenge what I'm saying. Huh? Matter of fact, you can go get, like my father said, you can go get four or five or ten of your best professors and line them up and I'll debate all of them on what I've said. They can get their books out and I'll get my books out and we can go to work. Huh? And we'll see who will win the debate, but we'll take any or all of your questions. Yes, sir, Bob. Um, my name is Michael. Stand up. Stand up. Yeah, stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. Stand yeah. And um, my question is, we have equal opportunities here in this country that is diverting the issue from racism or white supremacy. Do they this situation in America also, where they're uh, promoting equal opportunities? As you said, there's nothing like people, nobody they have that in America that's nullifying the, 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 the quest for uh, total <laughs> Yes, that's an excellent question. You say you have equal opportunity here. Huh? And they say we have equal opportunity in America. Dr. Martin Luther King, who I respect for fighting for equal rights and constitutional rights. They labored much to ensure that if I want to go to the bathroom with white folks, I can go to the bathroom with white folks. And if we want to sit down and have integrated fumes filling the rooms, then we can sit down and have an equal opportunity to have integrated fumes filling the rooms. If we want uh, to go to the restaurant with the white man or the airport, fine, we have all of those rights. Uh, we also uh, allegedly have fair employment acts and equal housing acts. And they say it's a free society. Just like they say it's a free society here. Let me explain to you all for your own knowledge about some of the negative aspects of the civil rights movement. Although we were able to gain constitutional rights in America, the problem is, is that we gave up everything we had black 
just to be able to go to the toilet with the white man. Just to be able to go in the restaurant with the white man, we gave up our own restaurants. We, when the period of segregation was in America, we were forced to build our own restaurants. We were forced to build our own transportation systems. We were forced to build a black economy. But we became so sick under the mindset of black inferiority and white supremacy that we were so happy just to go eat some food with some white folks that we, that we stopped and shut down all black restaurants, all black transportation systems, all black owned property. Now today in the black community in America, there's, an, there's a Korean or an Arab running everything in America. Any similarities is not a coincidence. Huh? In our community, my brother, uh, in the United States of America, almost every small business in the community is owned by an Asian or by an Arab. So we lost the gold during the Civil Rights Movement because we, we refused to embrace black nationalism. We refused to embrace Pan-Africanism. And I say to you today, here in England, even though you have equal opportunity, you must, you must enforce the opportunity to take up black nationalism and pan-Africanism and black power as your primary ideology. If you have equal opportunity, then you got the opportunity to own every one of these damn businesses that's in the black community here. You got the equal opportunity to go on and you own that business and you provide the services to your people. Don't let these guys with the red dot on their forehead talk to you anyway. Of course they're going to look down on us, the Pakistani, the Indian. They say, hell, ain't no Pakistani buying from me. Ain't no Indian buying from me. Uh, I'm serving it to you, but you should be serving it to yourself. Huh? You can't get so bourgeois where we don't want to build black businesses. When white people come out of here, they go in the mindset to build something for themselves. So that's the real struggle, sir. I'm so happy. Let me, let me say this. I, I have no love, no respect for. I say he's a liar, a criminal, a thief, and a criminal. A life, a liar, a thief, a criminal, and a murderer. I have no respect for George W. Bush. Oh, no good George W. Bush. Huh? The most notorious liar on the planet. Huh? A warmonger, a thief, huh? and a rogue. Huh? The number one terrorist on the planet Earth is not the the number one terrorist on the earth is not Ayman Zawahi. The number one terrorist on the planet earth is not Abu Masab Zakar. It ain't Hezbollah, it ain't Arafat, it ain't none of them. The number one and two terrorists on the planet earth are George W. Bush and Ariel Sharon. That's right. Uh, don't think I lost about And the number three is a little poodle. George Bush's little poodle, Tony Blair. Hmm? These guys are terrorists. These guys are criminals. But I, and we can talk about the Iraq War, and I'll tell you why the Iraq War will never end. But I'm here to say this. I'm not at all sad because George Bush has been reelected and old John Kerry did not win the presidency. Every time in America we get a liberal white man in the office of the presidency, we lose the desire to do anything for ourselves and lay back and start hoping that a liberal white man is going to help us. Liberal white folks can't do nothing for you today. So today you saw the electoral map in America. It was all red, all conservative, all Republican. White people in America are saying today, even if we have a president who's a liar, even if we have a president that uh, will get our young men killed by the thousands in Iraq and maimed and injured by the thousands in Iraq, even if we have a crazy cowboy president who will get $200 billion spent in Iraq with deficits mounting at home, even if we have an idiot, a fool, 
in office, as long as he can keep the niggas in place and keep white supremacy on top, then we'll back that man, George W. Bush. This is what the white man is telling us in America. And so now we don't have a choice. The Democratic Party as a national force in America is dead. The Democratic Party, we did everything. You saw Puffy on TV, Puff Daddy. Vote or die. Vote or die. Vote or die. Well, you voted and you're still dead. <laughs> you voted and died. <laughs> Look, do you know we voted like we never voted before in this past election? All black people came out to the polls with soul. We voted at 115% rate. 115% rate, meaning way beyond where we expected to vote. All Russell Simmons and Puffy and the rappers and everybody. Vote, vote, vote. We can vote, we can make a change. We can vote, we can make a change. We voted, 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 and voted. But guess what? The enemies voted and voted and voted and voted and voted and voted and voted. It's a white ran nation. I'm coming black. A white ran nation. So now we have but two choices in America. It's either conservatism and republicanism or black nationalism. Huh? We are forced now to do something for ourselves. We cannot depend on a government handout. We cannot depend on welfare. We cannot depend on a liberal white man. We are forced, like the children of Israel, to separate and to do something for ourselves. This is what you're facing all over the planet. The white man, the European, is tired of giving you welfare. He's tired of giving you handouts. And either you're going to do something for self or die. So I don't say vote or die. I say organize or die. I don't say vote or die. I say stand up and fight and do something for self or die. Yes, sir. And then I'm coming to the brother over here. Yeah. Um, considering the American government on the, the FBI, uh, the quantum role. Yes. In your form of organization, what steps have you taken on this occasion to nullify any moves by the European and European American people to destabilize the new black That's a very, very good question. The new Black Panther Party, and I want to say this. The new Black Panther Party, under the leadership of brothers and sisters, this is one of the most courageous black men in the United Kingdom right here. Some of you have read about him in different newspapers. My whole tour, he set up, working with Sister Angie and others, uh, working women and men, no sexism here. Uh, we understand that under the counterintelligence program of the United States government that the Black Panther Party, as well as the Nation of Islam and others, were targeted and destroyed. Today we have been resurrected. Right now as we speak, we have stood up the new Black Panther Party here in London. We have stood it up and are, uh, have now have membership in Nottingham, have membership in Birmingham, and working on membership in Manchester, Bristol, and Leicester. And we will not, sir, let the enemy do yesterday, I mean today, what he did yesterday. Now we have been in existence for 15 years now. The Black Panthers of the 1960s existed from 1966 to 1974, eight years. And at the end of those eight years, they made many gains and took some losses. We say history is best qualified to reward our research. And if we understand what happened yesterday, then we shall not let what happened yesterday go down today. My brother, today, the number one difference between the new Black Panther Party and the Black Panthers of the 60s is that we are a spiritually based organization. I got you, Katie, right there. Uh, matter of fact, let's do this. You can keep track. I don't want to miss this anymore out of order. How many have questions? Put your hands up. Okay, well let's say it like this one. Take your question, then your question. All right? We are a spiritually based organization and an African-centered organization. We, in the New Black Panther Party, uh, the party of the 60s was victimized by drugs, 
The party of the 60s was victimized by the leadership sleeping with white women. I loved them. Let me be clear on the record. But anywhere this go, I have the utmost respect for all members of the party. But if you're asking me a difference, there's got to be some differences if we're going to survive. Uh, and they didn't. So we are a spiritually based organization. And we, we say to the black Muslims, the black Christians, the black Hebrews, just the black believers, if you're none of that, if you're just a believer, we do not discriminate on the basis of religion, but we embrace a spiritual ideology. And we believe in the code of Mayat. And in Guzo Saba, we believe in the, ori in the original divine principle of African spirituality. And therefore, there's a moral code here. And our moral code enables us to defeat things like uh, the drug addiction, the cocaine, the heroin addiction, defeat things uh, uh, like I would say, uh, I would say that we're able and we do have what we believe is divine guidance. We don't just believe in our guns. We believe in self-defense, of course. We have to have some guns. Do y'all believe we have to have some guns? Yes, sir. Yes. Put your black hand up if you believe we have to have some guns. Huh? Some of you say, some of you got some guns, huh? Huh? Well, that could be a question whether we have or need guns, but I'm here to say that we don't worship our guns. We believe in our God and our guns. We believe in our God first and our gun. We believe if we get in the battle that our God will help us to shoot straight. <laughs> but we don't pray to a piece of steel. I don't walk around here trembling and shaking with my gun. Believe it. I believe that I walk with divine protection. I believe that this man, is that right? Yes, that sir. we walk with divine protection. We open up in the name of our God. We believe that we should be a praying people, a meditating people. And we believe that there's a God, that there's an El, that there's an Elohim, that there's a Yahweh, a Jehovah. We believe that there's a spiritual force that can guide us in the right direction and keep us away from the wrong direction. We don't, we don't, uh, in the days of the Panthers in the 1960s, we may come up in this rally here with our shotguns right out in this meeting. Is that right? <laughs> we may have our guns right out in this meeting, and it looks like all of you all are family, but some of y'all will be working for the British Intelligence Service. <laughs> and the one that's in here working with the British Intelligence Service will say, yeah, they got their guns. They're legal, they're legal, they got their guns, they're here, they're here. <laughs> now, damn it, the police will be surrounding the buildings, and we'll be up in here fighting or having a shootout, and some of us will be killed, and we'll kill some of them, and it'll be a big mess. So, hell, we may have some guns now, but you don't know it. That's right. Huh? Because we believe we got to be wise. We believe we got to be wise. So my simple answer, my brother, is we're wise. We're not going to say that, that we're not going to meet opposition. You cannot be a revolutionary or be a liberation, a liberator and not face opposition. If white folks don't give you some opposition, that means you ain't doing nothing. That's huh? Right. Exactly. And you cannot make progress without opposition. You cannot make progress without opposition. The American white man, in order to separate from the British white man, had to take up arms and, and well what was called a revolution. Is that right? The American white man picked up arms and, and got to going a revolution. And damn it, he went in the ship harbor and took a whole and had a riot in a harbor and took over and damn near burned the whole ship. Huh? And they call it the Boston Tea Party. Huh? But the white man took up arms for his freedom and his independence. He waged a revolution. He was ready to fight, bleed, and die in America. American white man to get free from the British white man. Are you willing to stand up, fight, kill, bleed, and die for your independence? The way the white man did? Huh? These white people fought world wars. Some of these young men, white people, 18, 19 years old, some of our people too, fighting in the white man's army. Black soldiers as well. But I say that the white man, one thing that I give the credit to the white man for, you see, today I don't give the white man too much credit at all. But some credit I give him is that he got hot. 
He got courage. If he's gonna fight for his nation, he's ready to die for his nation. That's right. His young man hit that beach at Normandy, hit that beach at Guadalcanal, hit them beaches in Sicily, hit them beaches knowing that the Germans had artillery guns and, and planes bombing the beach, knowing that he's gonna die as soon as he get the beach. And the ones that hit the beach, hit that beach, Johnny Ho! Hit that damn beach and died knowing that they were paving the way for some soldiers behind them. Huh? How many of you are willing to make the necessary sacrifices so, so that a future generation will not be subjugated to this second class citizenship and so that we don't have to see Africa in its condition? So my brother, yes, we do everything we can to be spiritual and divine and to protect our membership from the attacks of the enemy. But we know that there's going to be opposition, and opposition is necessary to, uh, to achieve success. I was told to come to England and to be a good boy while I was here. Did you know that? I was told that I should only speak on topics that are of importance to the black community, and that I should not stir up racial hatred or not speak about the Jews. Huh? The Jews told me this. The Jews. The Jews. So-called Jews. The what? So-called Jews. Huh? The so-called Jews. Why the do you say Jews. That? Why do you say that? They are not the true Jews. Go ahead. We are the original people. And the so-called Jews... Uh, synagogue of they, Satan. Sorry? They are from the synagogue of Satan. That's right. Yeah. Somebody look like they know something. <laughs> <laughs> You're a student, sir. That's right. But you're a good student. <laughs> I, do you know that on college campuses in America, when I asked them about Francis Quest Welsh, I've been in the audience last week in New Jersey, for a whole audience like this, and not one of them knew who Francis Quest Welsh was, or Dr. Ben, or anything. Many of them have been put to sleep. So you have an advantage. One thing about you taking advantage of, the, of, the, of this educational system here, many of you have a lot of educational credentials. And some of you have been studying knowledge that you can't get at these universities. I mean, you all, y'all step ahead of us. The white man made us all the way slaves. Some of you can't say that your parents or great, great, great grandparents were ever enslaved. Huh? This racism here is entrenched, but it's a little more subtle. You come to America, these chalk chewing, tobacco chewing, oh all wear crackers, you go in their neighborhood, they'll be calling you a nigger outright. Huh? So look, you have an advantage. Uh, I was told to be a good boy, but the Holy Quran in the fifth surah, in the 67th verse, says, uh, Allah talking to his messenger, the God talking to Muhammad, he says, O messenger, deliver that which has been revealed unto thee from thy Lord. And if thou doest not, thou art not my messenger. And Allah will protect thee from me. Huh? This is saying in the, uh, in the surah of the Quran, God talking to his messenger saying, look, I got a contract with you, but I'm also issuing you a warning. You must deliver that which I have given to you. Otherwise, I'm going to take your title away. I'm going to strip you of your post as my messenger. Uh, if you don't stand up and deliver that which I have revealed unto you. And then he says, I, Allah, the God, will protect you from men. This message I'm giving you tonight is a message of divine. The message uh, uh, that we're giving you tonight of Kwame Nkrumah, Marcus Garvey, Elijah Muhammad, the message of black liberation is just as divine, just as godly as the message given to Jesus, Abraham, Moses, or Muhammad. And you have a, a duty, you have a duty and I have a duty to deliver this message. And I don't fear the British intelligence. I don't fear the Jews. I fear God and God alone. And I've seen through this trip that God will protect me from men or protect me from the white man. Uh, God will protect you. But you must also deliver this message. You must take this message throughout the UK, man by man. Brother. My name is Julian and um, I live in Brixton. First of all, I just want to say thank you very much for sharing your wisdom. Thank you, sir. Fear of God only. Um, I just wanted to pick up on something you said earlier about Jesus. And it's just, it's been making me think over the first, over the last few days that if Jesus is black, or if Jesus was black, 
then that means the Romans were white. And uh, at that time, it was it's a good example, one of the first examples of a black man being persecuted in a white society. Right. Um, and you still see the same thing happening today. If a black man wants to get up and put himself closer to the things which are associated with God and with intelligence, that he will be persecuted because he's not staying in his place. And what I wanted to ask you is if you had any more kind of <coughs> any more kind of insight into that situation, into what was happening at that time. So I read something recently that said that maybe Jesus was up against so much because he was a revolutionary, because he was actually trying to tell people in Rome that they weren't doing the religion, they weren't conducting the religion in the right way. He was trying to tell them how it was really supposed to be done, and that's why he was having so much problems. So I just wanted to ask if you had any kind of insight or knowledge into it. Of that period of time. Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Give him a hand for it. Well, <laughs> Jesus or Yeshua, the black revolutionary Messiah, uh, called in Islam Esau ibn Mariam, uh, or uh, Yeshua bar Yosef in the Hebrew language, was a spiritual revolutionary. But one thing we must also understand about him is that he wasn't organized. Yahshua, Jesus, wasn't organized. He got him a squad and a team of disciples, and they went to work about doing the work of the conversion or the resurrection of the dead in Palestine. He was hated by the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire had spread through Palestine and North Africa and other areas and were under wicked rulers who were not spiritual men. Uh, the, Roman governors and the Roman rulers. They didn't give a damn about no God or no nothing. So yes, he was a threat to the Roman Empire, but the highest threat was from the so-called Jews, who he was opposed by in that day. Some of those Jews had come out of the caves and hills of Europe, and they were also white Jews, but some of them, they were also Jews of a mixed background, because in 500 BC, uh, Israel had been scattered in 500 BC under the Babylonian Empire. But it makes no difference. Sometimes we know that our opposition does not always come from white people. Huh? Our problems don't always come from white people. Sometimes they come from people that look just like us. Is that right? They come from people that look just like you. And they are always, when a new knowledge is on the scene, you as young people can relate. Yahshua, Jesus, was a young man. You know, he wasn't but 33 when he passed. But you today, if you trying to come up in society, particularly in leadership, you will find hostility or resistance from the older generation. You will find them trying to uh, keep you down, even if uh, you appear to be progressive. So he was attacked by primarily uh, the rabbinical order the Sanhedrin and the scribes. Scribe means writer, comes from the word scribos, writer, and the Pharisees, the religious order of that day. Similar to the way we are attacked by those who control the media today and under the so-called Jews. So uh, Revelations 2 and 9 says that those who say they are Jews and are not, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan. <laughs> these people, these are the ones under the Roman Empire who were calling for the death of the black revolutionary messiah. Because the scripture says that the Roman governor there was Pilate, right? And Pilate said, I don't have a dispute with this man. Is that right? He said, I don't find fault with this man. Why do you keep pressing me to kill this man? And they wouldn't let it go. And Pilate had a situation on his hand where he was going to have an insurrection amongst the so-called Jews there if he didn't put Jesus or the Yahshua to death. So it is the same in general today. Whenever there's truth or there's light on the scene, there will always be opposition from an existing order or an existing government. So I say that he caused trouble to the Roman government, but really it was the religious faction that caused him the most trouble today. Uh, but we should not despair, and Christian theology tells us not to despair because he was put to death because there can be no resurrection if there was no crucifixion. Huh? There can be no resurrection if there's no crucifixion. If he had not been killed and died, there would be no 
uh, spreading of his word today, even though that word has been misused and abused by the white man. So he is honored today, and uh, I think that there's much that we can learn. But remember, his ongoing battle today and yesterday was with the, was with the rabbinical order of the scribes and the Pharisees, the so-called Jews. Today, even today, they say he is not a prophet at all. I'm talking about the white Jews now. I'm not talking about the African Hebrew Israelites. Those with true knowledge and those uh, of the Hebrew faith that have the true divine insight understand that Yahshua is the anointed and the appointed one. And they accept him as the head of the Hebrew nation. But you go talk to them boys over there in Israel. You go talk to the Zionists. You go talk to Sharon and the boys. You go talk to the Ashkenazim Jews. The ones who were not in Palestine, but they got it from Europe. Or the Khazar, so-called Jews, that got it from Germany. Again, we say so-called like you do, brother, because the true Jew, the true original Hebrew from Abraham and Moses is an African. Uh, you go talk to them today, they still say the man is not even a prophet, and some of the Jews still today call Jesus a devil. Huh? Black power. I hope that helped you answer some of your questions. But he is a spiritual revolutionary, and what we must understand is that he is a man of African descent or Semitic, and whichever way you want to call it, he wasn't white. Jesus wasn't from Switzerland, Poland, Germany. He wasn't from none of that. He wasn't from England. So you, again, have to take that picture off of your wall. Take that billboard down in Ghana. Huh? Black power. Black power. Next, my right here, over here, King. Just briefly, so many of you can just be clear. 
we have a roadmap. And the first point of our 10 point platform says we want freedom. We want the power to practice self-determination and to determine the destiny of the black nation. And it goes on to describe how we believe in the Bible and the Quran and our divine destiny and other spiritual principles. Number two, it says we want full employment for our people and we demand the dignity to do for ourselves what we have begged the white man to do for us. Number three, it says we want tax exemption and an end to robbery of the black nation by the capitalists. We want an end to the capitalist domination of Africa and all of its forms. Imperialism, criminal settler colonialism, neo-colonialism, racism, sexism, Zionism, apartheid, and artificial borders. And goes on to give our position on reparations. I'm coming to you. Point number four, we want decent housing, fit for shelter of human beings, free health care, preventive and maintenance, we want an end to the trafficking of drugs and to the biological and chemical warfare targeted at our people. Point number five, we want education for our people that exposes the true nature of this devilish and decadent American society. Here we should say devilish and decadent English society. We want an education that teaches us our true history, history, and the role in our present day society. Point number six, we want all black men and women to be exempt from military service. Point number seven, huh? Yes. We want all black men and women to be exempt from military service. Speak on the question here. Mugabe. What you say now? I'm not going to fight against Mugabe. Are you going to let Britain send you into Zimbabwe with a gun? No, sir. Are you going to let them send you to Iraq? No, no. Huh? You going to go out there with the black watch boys? <laughs> Number eight, I made. Mean, we want freedom for all black men and women held in international military, federal, state, county, city jails and prisons. Where's the point? Number nine, we want all black people brought to trial to be tried in the court by a jury of their peers or peer group or people from the black community, as defined in this case by the white law of the Constitution of the United States. I'm sure it's something similar in the laws of the common law of England. Number 10, we demand an end to the racist death penalty as it applied to black, brown, oppressed people in America. We demand freedom for all political prisoners of black, red, and brown nations. That's our 10-point program, uh, and that's what we're fighting for. Yes, sir. Uh, what is, uh, what is our uh, what Speak is your, up. What, what is your front line? Is it in America, UK, Africa? That's a good question. Brother say, where's our front line? Yeah. Brother, I say the front lines are everywhere. We have a front line here in England. We have a front line in America. And we're soon hoping to establish more front lines in Africa. Absolutely. Our main focus is what I'm saying. We have a base. Our headquarters is in the capital of Babylon, Washington, D.C., in Babylon, America. But we also have front line, we're moving a front line struggle here in England. Tonight, I'm going to want some of you to join with us. And, and we're established and have some base in Germany and attempting to establish a further base. We believe we're trying to organize our people all over the planet. So that's where our front lines are. Is that the complete of the question? Yes. But let me say this then, and I'm coming, how many others have questions? You had your hand up first behind him, and then Baba here in the green, and uh, I can't diss my man. Did you ask him? You didn't ask a question. Right? Here, and I can't diss the sister, and I'm coming back here. And I'll move quickly also. Uh, but let me say this. Um, we in the New Black Panther Party are trying to build a mass movement. We're trying to build a mass movement. And we're recruiting members and supporters. We're recruiting members and supporters. We want some to join the party. How many think this black man is great? Huh? <laughs> to a member of this organization in the UK, how many would be willing to put on a uniform like this or like mine? Put your black hand in. Okay. Now, we say this, if you want to 
join and become a full-fledged member and to wear our beautiful uniforms. We have other uniforms. I had one last night. I had a three-piece African outfit on. We wear that. Others, some of our sisters, because we wear military fatigues, but we know that they're sisters that are soldiers. Some of them in Africa fighting, carrying guns and whatnot. But also, we believe in our sisters wearing nice, beautiful gowns and dresses and all of that. But we also have people in our organization that are with us, that support us, and they don't have to wear a military uniform at all. But we believe that we shouldn't cast them back out into the streets because they have talent. So we work with them at all. So we say either join the party or join in with us. Because you, we know, we see by tonight, you like what we're saying, you like what we're doing, and we, we'll talk about what we're going to do in the UK. So let me ask a question. How many of you believe that what I have said tonight is good for our people? Put your black fist up. If you believe it's good for our people, that's everybody. Uh, I mean, this is good for our people. Now, how many of you tonight would like to either join us or somehow, some way, just join in with us, be a part of this movement? Let me see your black fist and your black hand. That's everybody as well. Did you have a sign in list? So that means all of y'all. I got all y'all tonight. And I'm happy. I'm honored. Give yourself a black hand. Give yourself a black hand. I will give out the number. I will give you the cell phone number of the chairman. And we have your number. We'll call you for the meeting. But hey, you call us right away. And he give you the chairman's number here. And we'll see. We should organize a chapter right here on the campus. Is there a black student union on the campus? Huh? Well, there is one. That's good. Well, I'm sure they're not mad if we have another organization, right? How many would you like to see the new Black Panthers on the campus, huh? But then you stay, well, I just said how many of you would like it. You stay afterwards. If you're a real, real serious organizer, you stay afterwards. But what we're saying is and so we can support it's called the Black Student Union? What's it called? <laughs> African Caribbean what? Society. Society. Explain how it works. Same thing. Now I'll be scared because this is the first year that we've had one full black. What? Good. No. Yeah. But they start to see that this is going to happen. That's not true. What's that? We're going to have one. No, that's not true. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me. I've seen this and I've seen. I just. Let me make a point. Let me make a point. Let me say this, my sister. Let me say this. Oh, 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 oh. What'd you say? I said, I said it's not that racist, but anti-social organizations are there for it be stopped. What's that last statement you said? Can I, it can't be stopped? Let me say that loud. Cannot be stopped. Say it again, man. Cannot be stopped. Huh? Never limit your mind or your vision on what can be achieved. If you organize, there's too many black students on this campus for them to stop you. I'm seeing black people everywhere. Huh? If you want something on this campus, this is what the struggle was about in the 60s in America. A lot of the struggle was around black student unions and African studies. So I say you can do what you will. Hell, I'm here today. I'm here today, ain't I? You think they didn't know I was coming? You think they didn't go on the internet and on Google and search my name? <laughs> you think I wouldn't Google? They know I'm here, but they know if they say that they would stop me from coming here, they would have to deal with you. And they don't want to deal with you like that. So they just left me the hell alone. So we'll talk about it, but today we're happy that you, if you're a member of the African Caribbean Society, stay a member. If you're a member of any other organization, stay a member, but you can also join this. We believe in cross-membership and dual membership. I'm a member of other organizations, even though this is my primary organization. So again, we welcome and thank you for coming out tonight. Baba, right here, did I say you? Yeah. Right behind you, this man in the green. I'm going to keep my answer. I've been told to keep my answer short. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, before I
how many uh, indigenous African religions, Akan or others? How many just believe? Hmm? All right. Well, look, some of y'all in a good position because it's not hard to teach you out of what you've been taught. But look, if you go and read the Husea, it translates the Mayat. How many know Mayat? Somebody tell me. What does it mean? Come on, sister in the back with the white the original way of the way to live your life, to The Mayat is the spiritual wisdom of our foremothers and forefathers, the goddesses and the gods. But it is also, it means, Mayat means truth, justice, harmony, order, balance, righteousness, and reciprocity. It's a spiritual code, but it's also, it is also the teachings of the great pharaohs and others on spiritual matters. And it is the root of the Bible and the Quran. Huh? I say that it is the root. You can go into Husea and different surahs or ayats in the Quran. Sounds like it came just in the Quran. I'm coming to you, my brother. Sounds like it's just in the Quran. But if you go into the Husea, you'll find the exact language thousands of years before. You can go into the Bible. And the, the Ten Commandments, you think the Ten Commandments was given directly to Moses. But if you search, search and study the 42 negative confessions by Agnaton, who was the founder of monotheism before Abraham, huh? In the Mayat. So if you get to Hosea, if you be you reading the book of Psalms, continue to read the book of Psalms. But if you go into the Hosea, you'll find the origin of the teaching of the book of Psalms. So it gives you spiritual wisdom and insight from an African perspective and gives you the confidence that no matter if you say you're a Muslim, you're a Christian, you're a Hebrew, we are the origin of it all. And you can understand the root knowledge and connect back with yourself. Uh, so that's what I say, brother. Know yourself. Number two, organize. If you're not a member of the African Caribbean Social Club, if you're not a member of some organization, then you're not doing your job. Organize. Number three, commit yourself. Commit yourself tonight. Commit yourself that you will become and be a better revolutionary. Huh? I don't care how conservative you are, I don't care what you are, you have to come out of here tonight saying that I am a revolutionary. Huh? One who is dedicated to complete constructive change. I'm not saying you have to come out of here in some fatigues and boots with an AK-47 and some grenades. You can do that. But I'm saying you must be a revolutionary. Yeshua, a revolutionary. How many want to be a revolutionary? Huh? You want to be a, you want to change? Are you satisfied? You completely satisfied? Huh? Let me hear you say, I am. I am. I can't hear you. I am. I am. Revolutionary. Revolutionary. You said that too soft. I am. I am. A revolutionary. A revolutionary. I am. I am. A revolutionary. A revolutionary. Now practice that on a daily and consistent basis and watch this thing get better. My Bible, my Bible right here. Yeah. Speak up, please. Everyone be quiet. The truths of the Bible. The truth. Right. Well, yeah. first of all, you know, the Bible, as you should know, is full of contradiction. The Bible's got incest, it's got rape, it's got murder. You know, I think I forget to look at the chapter of Jeremiah, I think it's 19, verse 4 and 9, mm -hmm. where God called the Bible, God called some people to be by somebody in the Bible. If you look at the Prophet the Quran is said on Surah 4, verse 34, it says, A man can beat his wife. Yeah? And that's in the use of the Quran. I'm going to say it that way. Go ahead, I'm listening. Surah 4, verse 34. It says, A man can beat his wife. Beat her life. Exactly. That was written by the Quran. Go ahead, I'm listening. Well, according to my opinion, that the Quran is the Quran. 
That's telling me that all the people are going to against women. Can you see Surah 4 verse 7? Let me say this, my brother. Right. Let me say this. Your conclusion point on that? What are you saying about Bible? My point is, um, how can we support those things and those things? You know, let's provide this word of the Lord. Now I know the creator cannot um, tell lies. The creator cannot do evil. The creator cannot do evil. And the Bible like says, Lord with the contribution. You know what I'm saying? So if we're going to support that Bible, support the contribution, support the things that's really against my... Let me say this. Yeah? Let me say this. Go ahead. And also, also, you know, I listen to 10 pies and I block them home. And the vein that is asking, we want this, we want this. I say, revolutionary doesn't ask for nothing. Revolutionary takes it. You know what I'm saying? So this, 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 um, we want, we want, we're still asking for something, we're still begging for something, I'm not into that. And thirdly, thirdly, you know, from my understanding, you know, it's a certain person talking about um, politics and we want to get into parliament. Now how can parliament and politics after 600 years holocaust in the western world, where the white man have no intention of freeing African people globally, no intention whatsoever. How can any one singular person in Europe, in the um, European Parliament, benefit us? How can that help us in any way? I see that. Can um, impossible help us? Okay, let's start. He's raised. I'm trying to keep up with you. <laughs> saying number one, it says we want freedom. We want the power to practice self-determination and to determine the destiny of our community in the black nation. It goes on to say we believe in the spiritual high code, high moral code of our ancestors. We believe in the truths of the Bible, Quran, and other sacred texts and writings. We believe in Mayat and the principles of Nguzo Sabah. We believe that black people are free until we are able to determine our divine destiny. My brother, we say we believe in the truths of the Bible and the Quran, understanding that the Bible has been tampered with by Queen James, I mean King James. <laughs> the Bible has been tampered with. The Bible has been used against us. But guess what? Millions of our people, billions, believe in the Bible. Millions believe in it, and if I come to them, and say, black power, throw this damn book away. I will lose all of our people, many of them that can be saved because we have been nursed on the Bible. So do I throw the book away? Or do I, I know you just hold, just hold yourself. Do I throw the book away? Or do I give a divine reinterpretation of the Bible that gives us what? A black liberation theology. I say use the Bible and use the Quran, but they may be, but they have to be advanced from a black liberation perspective. What do I mean? When you read the Bible and you and you are speaking or reading in the book of Daniel about the Hebrew boys, this is us in America. Our, our interpretation of the book of Daniel about the Hebrew boys in America is that is that is a parallel to our condition in slavery. And just how they were robbed of their names and given the slave names of Shadrach, Meshach, and the bad Negro, I mean the bad Negro, that that is what has happened to us in America. And how the king gave them some poison meat. We teach in America is that this is how the white man gave us some poison meat, some hog and some pig feet and some chitlins. Huh? So we have a divine reinterpretation of the Bible that advances the liberation struggle. We have reinterpreted the Bible. And therefore, uh, when we speak about Jeremiah and Babylon, we teach that the Babylon of the Bible uh, is in fact, and we ain't making this up, we believe that this is the truth. That the, Bi that the Babylon of the Bible is what? Babylon America. Huh? 
And that America is what? The baby lion. The symbol of England is what? A lion. Huh? And we call America the baby lion or the battle lion. We also teach that from the Bible. And that the Bible says that Babylon was destroyed. Is that right? Yeah, right. That Babylon was destroyed. We teach that Babylon America will be destroyed by Almighty God. We teach that America is a modern day Sodom and Gomorrah from the Bible. And that this modern Sodom and Gomorrah America...